Hey folks, I hate to do this to you, but this week the human that makes all this work is out of town. I'm also a little buried in term papers. I want to make sure that no one goes dry on content, so I am going to play for you here an episode of a podcast I help run. It's about the researchers at the university I work for, and interviewing them about the cool stuff they do. This week's episode just happens to be an interview of me asking how America went from the party of Lincoln to the party of Trump. I also will include some of my more favorite frames from Step Back so far. I hope you enjoy, and I'll see you in two weeks. Sorry. Welcome to GradCast, the official podcast of the Society of Graduate Students at the University of Western Ontario. Coming to you from the other London, let's start the show. Hello, and welcome to the Western University Society of Graduate Students official podcast called GradCast. Today, we have a special conversation with our very own Tristan Johnson. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, everybody. Glad to be a guest once again. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to we look forward to hearing more about your work. So if you don't know, Tristan is our grand poobah, if you will, our commander in chief, <laughs> our chair of the committee, the first in our hearts and minds. Uh, not to mention producer, tech guy. Uh, um, he, I think he hauls, he is hauls the gear around. Oh yeah, too. I mean, so, I I could have helped, but I didn't today. Yeah. I also go by dear leader and glorious leader and. Um, Exalted leader? E eternal leader, eternal I believe. Leader. Is, yeah. yeah. The yeah. eternal party leader of the Grand Communist Party of Gradcast. Um, the shiny, happy people's Grand Communist Party of Gradcast. Right? You, do, you, you do have the red mic today. Mm. Oh, there you go. Well, it's, that's red. a great segue. <laughs> <laughs> great segue into our topic of today. So, Tristan, you have quite a few things on your plate uh, research-wise. And today you're going to talk to us a bit about... This is an interesting topic. This is very relevant to oh, what's going timely. on today. Very timely. Uh, I don't know if anyone's out there has heard of the American Republican Party. I mean, I think there's some guy there makes some bunch of claims. Oh, lots of guys. Oh, lo uh, they're mostly guys. Let's well, be honest. Oh, guys now. Yeah. Oh, they are guys. Yeah. Well, so Justin, what what do you study when it comes to this Republican of parties? So uh, this whole like show idea came together because. I very recently was putting together a lecture for our uh, History 2301 American History, like all American History class, on the 1970s and the conservative issues that rose to kind of lead to um, the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, which is not my, 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 my actual area of research is about September 11th and memory and technology and all this kind of stuff. But uh, Yiming came to me and said that um, he and probably many people out there have some nagging questions about just what the hell's going on with the Republican uh, race because it's been uh, quite a train wreck to watch <laughs> for the last few months or last year actually we're getting close to a year since it started oh yeah oh, gosh. and the it's like the most cinematic like I can't I don't remember a because I've watched now like probably three presidential elections three or four and I've never seen one that's this well watched and so a lot of people are like kind of confused as to what's a primary, what's a caucus, and also who the hell is Donald Trump and why is this happening? Why, why, why is this Kafka's nightmare becoming to reality? Um, and I thought there'd be a lot of questions out there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, guilty as charged. I <laughs> do know next nothing about American politics, except what, you know, um, online social media tells me. <laughs> and you know, what little I remember from my grade schooling. Uh, so basically, my question that's one of the questions that I had that sort of spurred this special edition, I guess, is how in the history did, um, how you know, in the history? how in the oh. history did uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, Republic, the Republican Party, the, the party of Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, the guy who famously, you know, freed the slaves and kept the United States forcefully together through civil war, uh, and is credited with a lot of fairly progressive, you know, policies and um, stuff. How did, how did that same Republican Party become 
come to a place, a timeline, the, the darkest, perhaps, timeline, <laughs> uh, where Donald Trump stands a legitimate chance of winning the presidency of the United States. All right. Well, that that's a mouthful. Um, it, it, it's, a good, it's a good question because, yeah, um, when people think of the Republican Party, like if you look at the Republican Party of even Teddy Roosevelt or, or, or Lincoln, that the Republican Party is known for being progressive and all of these really great things. And, and, and sort of see, northern as well? Yeah, is that right? Because well, they, yeah. I mean, a lot of the, the, the separatists were like Southern Democrats, if mm-hmm. I understand correctly. So if, I, so if we're going to go back, yeah, let's talk about like the end of the Civil War. Uh, the oh Democratic boy. Party. Let's go back. The, the Democratic Party is in shambles because, yeah, the Democrats in the South. Uh, were the governments responsible for secession and the Confederacy and all those things. And so the Democratic Party is this southern racist party. And they will rise again? Is that right? Uh, let's not get into that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, More like the Phoenix. So after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, they had this guy named Andrew Johnson. And Andrew Johnson really screwed up... Um, the the moment because the idea of like progressive and conservative wasn't really a thing yet and so at this time people had uh the the main issue was about slavery and the main thing that they got in big fights about was like tariffs and weird things like that Uh, whether or not america should be on the gold standard these are the kind of political issues they had of the day and so uh the democrats basically uh, were wiped out in the South for like a very short amount of time, and you actually had in like the late um, 1860s like black legislators getting elected in the South oh, wow. with the Republican Party, and then uh, the Democratic states finally, through intimidation, race, intimidation and violence, suppressed black voters in the South, and the Democratic Party basically took over, and this led um, like this conservative South versus. This kind of progressive, I mean, to an extent, progressive North. Progressive of their time, maybe. Yeah, yeah okay. 19th century progressive. 19th century, yeah. uh, so what happens after that is uh, Ulysses S. Grant becomes president. He's a Republican. And he is well-intentioned, but right? extremely bad. Yeah, he was the, he was the Union general. Uh, but he ends up being this really ineffectual president, but also really corrupt. And for a number of decades, the Democrats have no political power on the federal level. And the Republicans, uh, the, com- the government gets really Republican and really corrupt. And so for decades, you have this corrupt, uh, kind of like the Tammany Hall period. And this is typically known as like the Gilded Age. This is where you have a lot of presidents that didn't really do all that much. This is like pre- presidents like Grover Cleveland, or not Grover Cleveland, sorry, like uh, Garfield, Garfield, yeah. President Garfield, President McKinley, mm-hmm. all these presidents you probably haven't heard of. Oh, I've heard of or them. Or you've heard of them in, in, in a joke sense, mm-hmm. the joke presidents. Yeah, or, um, or Rutherford B. Hayes, things like that. And what happens is that Teddy Roosevelt becomes president after McKinley's assassinated. Assassinations make a big difference. Um, and, and Teddy was Republican. He was a Republican. All right. But he was upset with the way that the corrupt um, laissez-faire, which means not non-government, non-economic interfering uh, party was going. And so he broke up the biggest companies in America. He mm-hmm. told Standard Oil to break into five different companies. And that's how we have a lot of like, that's how we have Exxon and, and uh, Esso and all those companies that have now all re- re-merged. But um, <laughs> that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. yeah. And so... Um, he gets known as like the trust buster. And after he is done being president, he hands it off to Taft and goes off to kill animals in Africa for a while. Not, well, we should mention Teddy Roosevelt, uh, I'm gonna put in my two cents, was also the leader in creating parks. Yep. That's a, I'd say that's sort of a progressive thing. Right, well, to thing. preserve animals, so he to, to kill, kill them, them later that's on, true. right? But mm-hmm. again, another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> He's also an uh, imperialist. He was a warmonger, racist, all of those things put together. Um, what happens, though, is Taft is the leader of the Republican Party, running for, and he runs for a second term. Roosevelt comes back, and he really hates the way that Taft has like turned the Republican Party into this conservative party. And so Roosevelt, 
uh, Roosevelt makes his own political party. It's called the Progressive Party, or nicknamed the Bull Moose Party. So was this the time that Republicanism and conservatism have kind of been used together the first time? Was during the Taft era? Or? I mean, there's like this is like a point where like the term conservative doesn't have much meaning at this point. Like everyone is kind of conservative, uh, just that like the Democrats are more aligned with the interests of like farmers and southerners while like republicans are focused on the interests of like industry leaders bankers those kinds of things like that's the main in- they they they're they're almost more focused on specific interests rather than like grand political philosophies so it's a lot of it basically based on economic factors rather than sort of social political kind of yeah. things the main the main issue they fought over was tariffs whether or not right. you have high tariffs so that it's, um, you can make a lot of money off of manufactured goods in the north, or low tariffs so that farmers in the south could sell their goods to the international market easier. It's literally like, it's just like that. <laughs> um, but when Teddy Roosevelt runs on the Bull Moose Party as this like progressive, like this idea of the government getting involved in the economy mm-hmm. and, and ha- making things better for workers, supporting unions, things like that, which is a very novel idea at that time, the Repu- uh, all of the Republicans who are kind of Teddy Roosevelt Republicans leave and join with um, with Roosevelt or with Roosevelt. The Democrats uh, t- uh, make an alliance with a party, the, the Socialist Party at the time. Are the Socialist Party runs at the time, and so that split vote leads to the election of Woodrow Wilson in 1912. And what this does is it makes um, Woodrow Wilson also campaigns on progressive ideals. Everyone is, is trying to like fight to take over this new progressive movement, basically. And uh, Woodrow Wilson wins and puts in a bunch of progressive stuff. And so the Republicans are now in opposition to the Democrats, who are the spokespeople for the progressive movement. Does that, does that all make sense? Wait, so the Democrats <laughs> are the spokespeople now for the progressive movement. Is that where we're at? Yeah. Okay. Although so they're, they're, they still represent the South. And that, right. that's why, uh, from that point on, the Democrats are playing this really interesting game where they have to balance like northern progressives and southern progressives but who are also racist and this becomes a big deal because in the 1950s when the civil rights movement starts happening um and uh after eisenhower is done being president and we get president kennedy who's a democrat he has to I'm, I'm like skipping forward tons of history because we're like really limited on time here. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so Kennedy has to, or starts to become more sympathetic towards civil rights mm-hmm. because before then it was like, um, like how in the eighties there were gay people in both the Republican and democratic party because both sides really weren't paying that much attention to them. Uh, then when the Democrats came to help gay people or at least uh, became pro gay, uh, in the 2000s, then you have this like escape of like there's not many gay people in the Republican Party anymore. <laughs> that it's it's kind of a similar situation. Uh, so Democrat or or uh, people who ah, black people who really didn't like uh, or who didn't really didn't like the Democrats because of the KKK and all those things start oddly voting for the Democrats uh, because of JFK's or. Uh, eventually JFK support, but more Lyndon B. Johnson's support for civil rights and all those things. So as the Democrats really claimed that progressive movement, which was equality mm-hmm. for people of different races. And then, of course, people, of course, would vote for the group that supported that. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit, um, we're getting, I, I got, I, into, I made things a little mixed because there's like progressive in like the early 20th century sense, which is like, Let's uh, improve unions, eight-hour workday, and child labor type stuff. And then there's the progressive term we use today, which is really just using liberal, but we don't like we're using the word liberal anymore because it's a dirty word in American vernacular. So uh, in that, it comes out of, like, the Depression and things like – or that comes um, – out of like Nixon type stuff too. So yeah, mm-hmm. we've we've reached nearly the point that you have just talked about recently, which was the Nixon Reagan era and mm-hmm. the new conservatism. Yeah. So in the 1960s, uh, with Lyndon Johnson, the Democrats, when he when he signed the Civil Rights Bill, he said, "We've sold the South to the Republicans for a generation." We didn't know it was going to be way longer than a generation. Uh, and shortly after, when um, Johnson's going or when Johnson's running for president, he uh, gets, uh, there's this independent run by a man named George Wallace, 
who's like a Alabama governor, who's a Democrat, but pro-segregation. And he basically pushes, uh, he gets the whites in the South who were typically like still for the New Deal, liked social programs, but they were very racist and says, and gets them kind of courted into the realm of Republic or of uh, conservative ideas. And then um, when the Republicans run uh, Barry Goldwater, the same thing happens. And uh, when Barry Goldwater runs and from basically night or when Barry Goldwater fails running for president against Johnson, but then when Nixon gets elected from 1968 onward, the South is Republican. And that incorporates all of the political issues of the South into it. So it, it kind of sounds like uh, it's more of a geography uh, ideal than the name of the party, because the name of the party doesn't really stand for anything. I, I always found it was funny that Republican means the people ruled. Uh, whereas we think of, we don't really think of that as what the Re- Republican Party is now. So, the name doesn't really matter so much. Uh, not really. Like the Republican Party started because there was the Democrats and the Whigs, and they were a anti-slavery uh, version of the. They're like an anti-slavery conservative alternative to the Democrats. Hmm. Um, that was basically what they started as. But then the Whigs all became Republicans, and then that, everything got mixed up. But it does show that political parties change a lot. And much quicker than you think. And we, um, if we don't study history, we kind of get this feeling that like the way things are, the way they always were. Yeah, let's dispel with mm-hmm. that, you know, myth, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's dispel. Yeah. So that kind of, I guess, brings us to what we think of as republicanism now, what mm-hmm. it has been in m- media, and where that our view of current republicanism came from. I'd add a couple more things because if we, if I don't, if I don't say that, then. Um, it just sounds like the Republicans courted racists, and that's a bit of like an unfair way to describe them because there's also the religious right that has always had um, like conservative evangelical Christians or Catholics that uh, started getting really angry in the 70s about things like Roe v. Wade, which legalized abortion, and also a Supreme Court decision that outlawed mandatory prayer in schools. And that galvanizes, brings out religious people uh, to support the conservatives. Then there's also neoconservatives who are like these liberals who get disillusioned with the way that politics works and become super conservative and become, this is kind of the political ideology like Ronald Reagan and the George Bushes. And conservative women who are against the women's liberation movement, people like Phyllis Schlafly trying to oppose the Equal Rights Amendment, which failed, uh, they all kind of come together and rally behind uh, or they kind of ra- uh, get a lot of energy from the really depressing bad times that happened in the 1970s, like bad economy, uh, oh, Richard Nixon, oh, all those shortage, things. Yeah. All that, yeah. Uh, and they, they use that kind of disaffectedness with the way the state works and launch Reagan to become president. He becomes, uh, he has this anti-government, anti, um, anti-government, anti-communist message that really Americans loved. Well, and he plus, was, he was a movie star. He was yes. a movie star. He was a very good communicator, very good speaker. A great uh, very one. Very good storyteller. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, the thing about Ronald Reagan is, like, yeah, there's a lot to complain about with him. And we could do an entire podcast of me yelling about how much I don't like Ronald Reagan. But he had an effective message. And there was a lot of people who had been let down by, by the great society. All of these, these ways that we thought that we could use experts and political, like, uh, government programs to help people turned out to just not be enough and people and people got it legitimately disaffected by that so i from what i gather what you're saying is what the reagan came out the reagan mm-hmm. uh, the, 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 the reagan gipper. <laughs> the gipper the reagan era i guess came about because people were disappointed with how the world was yeah or how their country was at least because uh, if you think about it um the 1970s was the end of like 30 years of like huge economic growth low interest rates high equality like the lowest inequality the u.s will uh, ha- ever had and ever had afterwards oh geez and it was this period where you could get a house for six thousand dollars uh you could move to the suburbs own a house 
and raise 2.5 kids without getting a university degree and all of these things. And so people... What they call the American dream. Yeah, it, it's really, this is the time that when people talk about the great past in America, they're usually going back to this period, the 19... Now, this is, of course, exclusively for white people. Yeah, I was but, just um, going to say. And, and white males, well, white we'll males, say. Yeah. Wasn't so great for women at the mm-hmm. time, either. <laughs> and, uh, and so... Uh, to kind of go through, uh, to kind of uh, fast forward a little bit, we come to today's election. Right. With, in November, eh? Yeah, with, with, with um, the one that's coming up in November. And people are rallying around this, this Trump guy. Now, you, you're saying that this is sort of a parallel, that people are disappointed that the quote-unquote American dream has crumbled again before them, so they want... And he's going to make America great, just like a, back in the day. Again, just like it, how great it was in the 60s. I mean... Yeah, because he, he's kind of, I mean, he's got Reagan-esque type things. He's, he's really good with the camera. He knows how to work the media. He's, um, he's arguing on, like, getting America great again, America winning, all these things that really resonate with people who have had their houses foreclosed on them, who have, have watched um, Obama spend eight years like letting the people who caused the financial crisis go scot-free and putting us back in the situation where things are again. It's like people are legitimately disaffected. People are legitimately unhappy with the way things are. And then somebody comes, a celebrity who's really good, really powerful speaker, says, your, problem, your problems are because there's Mexicans coming and taking your jobs. There's pro- this problem is because we have the danger of, of foreigners uh, making us unsafe. And this... Mm-hmm. Is, this Giving simple answers. Giving really. understandable answers, yeah, at least. Yeah, exactly. Simple, mm-hmm. just it's their fault, and we get rid them of them, over your, there. Your, yep. your problems are solved. Exactly. Or at least uh, if we can trust like a president who's not from the system that caused this, maybe we'll get something better. Uh, that, that's, what the, that's what I think is resonating with them. And there's also some stuff on like Vox about the rise of authoritarian thinking and all these it, there's, there's oh. some scary new stuff going on too mm-hmm. I don't but, know I think uh, some people like the idea that it's a problem that they're experiencing say the American people are experiencing mm-hmm. a problem and someone's going to come and solve it yep. and he will say it without irony or not without irony without understanding that without letting people know that it's he, he can't or he may not or he just says he will mm-hmm. and okay I'll sit back and let someone else take care of the problem and I think if, if you can learn one thing from this election it shows that America is really frustrated with both eight years of George Bush and eight years of Obama and has galvanized a lot of negativity on both sides of the aisle which makes for uh, two candidates, really, to capitalize on that and say, propose solutions. And whether or not you agree with their solutions, you can at least admit that the, the frustration is there and it's real. And I don't want to take that away from them. But on the other hand, using this emotion to push scapegoating and totalitarian ideas is really scary because this is, this is how fascism happens. And so uh, it's really scary. Oh, well, I think that pretty much, well, that says it all. Don't let mm-hmm. fear be your uh, voting decision. Mm-hmm. Well, Sounds kind of cynical. It, it this is. This whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But Obama did say, though, uh, the person who, who campaigns on optimism will be the one who wins in the long term. And I, I, I don't think there is a candidate who's doing that anymore, sadly. I, I, well, I mean, winning sounds pretty optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> sounds that, great. That's, that's fair. And I absolutely wholeheartedly look forward to uh, you know having mm-hmm. our supreme overlord Emperor Trump in the I, near future I love that you are a, like a it, real life troll <laughs> just you are it's great uh, well I think that's all we've got time for today mm-hmm. um, thank you so much Tristan our, our overlord and uh, thank you Yemen eternal leader oh eternal leader make gradcast great again make gradcast great again yes it's mm-hmm. been gradcast with Yemen Chen and me Susan Anthony thanks so much for joining us thank you no Trump that's all we got for this week. If you like this episode, share it with someone. Check us all out on Twitter and Facebook. Both you can find through Gradcast Radio. You can go to our website to see more episodes at gradcastradio.ca. And if you want to come on the show and talk about your own research, great line for your CV, go to gradcastradio at gmail.com. The theme is Happy Boy by Kevin McLeod, and we will see you guys next time.